Hello, this is Tom, Junkie XL, and we're back again for another studio time with Junkie XL. And in this episode, I want to talk about cork. Uh, cork has always been a very important part uh, of my life, and um, it was technically the very, very, very first synthesizer that I had, uh, which is sitting right here, and it's the cork MS10. And it's a beautiful box, it's very, very simple. Uh, I used it a lot during uh, the first um, uh, Junkie XL shows, and I call it um, the, the, the Wintersizer uh, to make this typical sweep. That's a little loud. So I use it actually a lot um, in breaks to, you know, to build up noise before the beat uh, kicks back in. And I always had it on my left and uh, I had a few of them. Uh, they broke easily on tour and you know, so I had uh, you know, some replacements. I sometimes threw with them and I stood on them and, uh, but they you know, always worked. They were very, very reliable. Um, and the other sounds that come out of it, um, they vary actually quite a lot. And basically it's a pretty aggressive uh, synthesizer. This is the sine wave. We have four ranges that the synth can go. Let's go to the saw wave. But then if you play with the attack time, and you put it in a different range, you know, out of a sudden, it sounds like way softer when you use the filter down. As you can hear, this needs to go to the shop soon too. It has some tuning issues. Like I said before, that's what you get with old gear. Now let's move over to this one, which is the MS-20. I do have an original MS-20 from the 70s, like the MS-10, but this is actually a brand new one. And um, it's made by Cork. Um, they started making them like a couple of years ago um, with the original idea of components. It's fully analog. And I've compared it with the real MS-20 and they're almost the same. Like I have to say, like they're very, very similar. The filter is maybe not as aggressive as the, as the one from the 70s. It's probably not as dirty as the one from the 70s. But other than that, I prefer to use this one because it's cleaner and it's less um, noisy. Um, so this thing is in a way very similar to the, M uh, to the MS-10. But the MS-10 and the MS-20 have a completely different sound. The MS-10 is very thick and very, um, very raw. Whereas this synth... ...is very polite, I would almost say. So that was the case with the original MS-22. It's, it's, uh, it's not just because this is the new one. But this one has a few extra features um, that uh, the, um, the MS-10 doesn't have. For starters, it has a built-in EQ uh, that you can use. Um, and it also has an extra filter. And it also has an extra M um, VCO. So that makes it quite interesting to get uh, thicker sounds. You can detune them separately from them. It's very great to do and uh, to play with those, you know, different detunings and create uh, different sounds. The other thing that it has, which is the MSN doesn't have, it has an extra filter, uh, which is a high pass filter. So the right filter But we also have 
And the cool thing also is with both these synthesizers is that it was uh, a synthesizer that was a step up from uh, a normal synthesizer because it allowed you to patch some extra things. As we can see here, we see the sockets um, that are here and we see them here too, a little more complicated than, than over here. And here you were able to patch some sounds into different holes and actually control uh, the synthesizer almost like a modular synth but not as modular as a modular synth which we'll get to in a different episode but it gave you really great uh, control over the synthesizer and this one is still being made new also in a mini version and um, it's really worthwhile addition to uh, your synthesizer it really sounds like nothing else the cork has its own sound in the 70s that was really unique um, Part of that series is also the MS-50, which is um, um, a module with no keyboard, with just one oscillator and a meter in it. Now that synthesizer sounds extremely smooth. I used to have one now, but I sold it to a really good friend of mine. Maybe he borrows it back to me so I can show you uh, it in the, in the tutorial. And that also come, came with a sequencer, a 12-step sequencer. Um, and that was the series that Cork released in the 70s. Um, and there was one extra box that was part of that as well, which I have over here, and that is the vocoder that they made. Um, this vocoder is um, way simpler than uh, the Roland that I showed in another episode, but this one, like Cork in the 70s, had a really, really uh, unique uh, character. So, again, um, you need to sing into the microphone um, for sounds uh, to come out. So. I'm just going to make some noise and at this point nothing is happening because I'm not playing the keyboard but now I will play the keyboard. A few options that you have, not a whole lot, um, but an option is to put the ensemble on and off. Ensemble is a sort of chorus so if I switch that off it sounds more plain. Another option that you have is to add modulation or vibrato to the sounds that is making in the vocoder. The other thing you can do is switch in octave and then with the pitch you can go even lower if you want to. Not as quite as robot craft work as the, as, the, as the roller was, but I really enjoy this box. And the other cool thing is it has an external input, so you could technically run a drum loop or anything else through this box, and then you could play chords, so while you're playing the chords, you hear the, the, the drum rhythm, but then vocode it in the, in the chords. Uh, I don't have something routed into it, but if I would sing rhythms, you would know what I mean. <laughs> that's how you could do that. Okay, I want to move actually to that side of the studio um, where we have two classic boxes. One is the PS3100 made by Cork and this beast is the 3300. Now I will be demonstrating the 3300. The PS3100 unfortunately just died on me. I can try it one more time by switching it on. Um, it will be a loud pop, but we can edit that pop out so you will not be hearing this. Uh, but let me tell you first what this is. Um, this is, 
extremely unique when it came out. This synthesizer has a polyphony of 48 voices. Yes, you hear that right, 48. While all these other synths that I've been showing in all the tutorials are four or sometimes two or monophonic a lot, as some maybe up to eight, but 48, I mean, that is like insane. Um, and the reason why this thing is so big, and this one even bigger, is that back in the day, every oscillator had his own print board inside. It wasn't like some smart electronic stuff that we have right now to make uh, synthesizers. Um, actually, every board was a voice with its filter and its ADSR and everything that came with it. Um, so that was really unique. So basically you can put your hands down like this and every note will sound on the, on the keyboard way too much, obviously. Well, what is interesting though is that to a certain extent they are sounding a little familiar to the MS-10 and the MS-20 that I showed, even though they, these came out earlier. Um, but they sound kind of thin. These are not really big sounding synthesizers. When you look at the size, you would think, man, the low end is going to be great. But actually it's not. It, it, but it still has a very unique sound to it. Um, let me switch this thing on. Be aware of the loud pop and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. That was the pop, I'm gonna play it. And I hear something. and the sound has disappeared and it's gone now. So unfortunately, my friends, it has to go to the shop, to the doctor and be taken care of. You need to be taking care of these babies well, you need to talk to them, and you need to pet them every now and then because they're puppies that need love. So let's now focus on this be beast underneath. This is interesting because this comes with a keyboard that you connect with a really big connector over there. Now the keyboard, is lost and the connector is lost um, and they're incredibly hard to find. I think of this box right here, there may be 50 around or 60 um, in the whole world. And this box basically is three times what this synth is. So here is one, there is one and there is one. And since we can play it with the keyboard, I use this company from England, Kenton Retrofit MIDI. This is an amazing company um, that pretty much makes a MIDI kit for every old synthesizer and put it in and hooray, now with MIDI we can play all these old synthesizers. Most of the synthesizers that I have here in my studio are retrofitted MIDI so I can actually use them in a production that uh, I need that instrument for. Um, so we have MIDI coming in into this thing, so I'm just going to open up the volume now of um, synthesizer section number one and let's see what that does. So we hear a bass line. Actually the bass line that we're listening to is one of the bass lines that I used for Mad Max. I didn't make it with the 3300, but it's the, it's the line. And as you can see, it sounds kind of thin. It doesn't really sound like, woo, aggressive, or it, it's kind of mellow, polite. And it has all these really interesting modulation uh, opportunities with it. Modulating the sound now with another LFO. Really interesting. And then it has this, resonate a function in it. It almost functions like a flanger. So on three frequencies, on three frequencies, you could um, you could set a resonator and then you can, with an LFO, let it move. It's a very unique feature for that synthesizer. It's not really any synthesizer I can recall that had this feature, so they were very unique in that. So that's one section, let me switch that off, and then we go to the second synthesizer. 
which I have a completely different wave selected here. This is a sine wave, saw wave, recorder wave, pulse, small pulse, and this one is adjustable. So let's just stick it to the pulse. I have a different scale, like for every module. Also here we have that same uh, sexy resonator, so let's set the frequency to different frequencies as the first one. So let's now go to the third synthesizer. Again, these are three individual synthesizers and they're all basically one of these. So you have three of these in here. So let's now open up the third one. Again, I'm playing with that unique feature, the resonance filter. So we've been focusing on just one element at a time. Uh, let's now all bring them in at the, at, at the same time. So now we have number one. Number two. Number three. So another thing I'd like to say about these two synths is that we see something similar that what we saw in the MS-10 and the MS-20. And it's the concept of being able to patch a couple of things around in the synthesizer, so making them semi-modular. And we see that here too. Um, another really interesting feature of both synths is that you could actually tune every individual note that you play within an octave. So that way you were actually able to micro tune your scale and just play scales that are not necessarily Western. Um, so it's great to program um, Arabian scaling or anything um, outlandish with quarter notes. And it, it, so this is like perfect for that. So Looking back in time, it was a massive undertaking to make a synthesizer like that and very applaudable for what they tried to uh, accomplish with these. Uh, people like Vangelis, uh, Shamil Sejar, um, were people that had these synthesizers and used them for uh, specific um, uh, purposes. Um, so that is about the cork synthesizers right now in this studio. Now I would like to take you to another room where I want to play another centerpiece of their releases and show you two other models. Okay, so we're inside the house, um, my um, private uh, writing room. Um, and I wanted to show you th uh, four more items that are uh, made by cork. We're looking here at the cork trident. Uh, the Cork Trident was, um, was an important synthesizer because it added a few things together that was um, actually kind of normal in, the, in that time period. We're talking about the half to late uh, 70s. Um, what actually happened is that there were organs out, uh, electronic organs, and ever so slightly a, a transition was being made into real uh, proper synthesizers. And that happened step by step. 
So first you had an organ and then there was a brass section and a string section and an organ section and then a synthesizer lead. And then the synthesizer lead, you were able to program some very simple parameters like cutoff frequency, attack, release, um, but very, very basic stuff. So um, the Trident, there were two made, the Trident and then the Trident Mark II, um, 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 had, had these features that I was just talking about. So let me just go over the keyboard with you for a second. Um, if we, um, I'm putting my glasses on uh, because my eyesight is getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so if we look to the right, we see a string section. If we look in the middle, we see a brass section. And if we look to the left, we see a synthesizer section. Now, what is unique about the synthesizer compared to some of the other ones back then is that the brass and the string section would be very big and very elaborate with organs and it would be just a small section here that would be the synthesizer. Here, that is reversed. The synthesizer is an important part, but it still adds the brass and the strings and you can play them all at the same time. And you could do all these really sexy stuff like um, I want the synthesizer here and the brass here and then the strings over here. Um, so there were all these options to, to do that. Um, the first section I want to play to you is uh, the brass and what you could, uh, could do with that. So this is the sound of the, of the, of the brass, but you have functions like uh, cutoff frequency, resonance, um, your uh, ADSR, and I'm just gonna play a little bit and see what you, what, you, what you can do with it and then you will hear the differences. Also, you're able to play one octave, a high octave or both at the same time, which is also a very unique uh, feature. That way, when you keep doing that on the synth, the amount of voices that you're able to play is actually quite significant, is significant and it turns into a really, really big sound. But let's just start simple with just the brass. So let's now add that second octave to it, or let's do in just the high octave. But you can play them both at the same time. Pretty nice sound. So it has its own little mixer here so I can make it louder, quieter or switch it off. Which means at this point I don't hear any sound because none of the other sections are switched on. So now let's go to the string section and the string section offers exactly the same thing as the brass but it has a couple of extra interesting features. Um, you can add a bowing quality to the strings, vibrato on or off ensemble on and off. Ensemble is a sort of like chorus effect. Um, so let's just um, uh, select the lower register and let's just play around a little bit with it and you can hear what, what's going on. I have to switch it on though. <laughs> <laughs> That's the equalizer section. You could make it thinner and brighter. So that's the bowing I just switched on. So what that does is emu it emulates the bowing of the strings. It also has an attack and release, so I can make that a little shorter.
different registers. So that is with the ensemble off. And funny enough, sometimes these old analog boxes can sound pretty convincing. And of course, I hear you think, what is this guy talking about? It sounds so synthesized as you can, but I mean, it, you know, that's how they, how they made it uh, at the time. So let's now put all three registers on. And now let's add the brass to it. Now that for the time was really pretty big sounding. Um, so now switch these things off and let's now focus on the, um, on the synthesizer, which I'm now gonna switch on. Where the older organs with a synthesizer parts were not really all that complicated. Um, this is not a complicated synth, but you could do really interesting stuff with it. So obviously you have your scale. I'm just gonna turn the volume a little down so I can actually talk to you guys. Higher, saw wave, pulse, pulse width, pulse width with modulation. And you can determine how much modulation you want, the speed of the modulation. Um, that doesn't give you an option what waveform to choose, um, but you, you could add it to the first one and you can detune it separately from the original one to create an even fatter sound or you can switch it off. You see you got that really nice chorusy effect. We get to the filter section. It can listen to the ADSR, whether it's normal or whether it's reversed. Um, and it has a cutoff frequency. And it almost has a self-oscillating resonance, but not quite. Um, and we lost sound altogether. Oh, here we go. So quite interesting to make some to, to make some sounds with. This thing was also 100% polyphonic, so we could we can use, for instance, this as a sound. Detune it even more, and now we can say, okay, I want the strings to go with that. The volume is off. Now we put the brass on top of everything, and now we have all the strings playing in three octaves, the brass in two octaves, and the full synth that we quickly just programmed.
So that's the, more, the cork trident, and it's um, a synth that was, you know, widely used by the synth guys that wanted to create this really massive sound. Um, people like Vangelis, Jamal Sajar, um, a lot of people had them, and they were very popular because of the flexibility of the big sound. Not a synthesizer to buy to create really original synthesizer sounds. It just has a really nice full sound that works really well in pretty much any production. I use it a lot to thicken up big string sections or big uh, brass sections and always underneath there's a little bit of the trident playing along to, to beef it up and make it fatter. So now I want to move to the couch here. Um, this synth at this point is not hooked up because also this synth is a little bit sick. It needs to go to the doctor. Um, but um, this is the Poly 6, which is another synthesizer that was built by Cork. It um, was very popular. Um, I just want to go quickly the overview of the synth. On the left we see uh, the volume, the tuning. Uh, here we see the VCO. Um, where you can select your waveform, in what octave you are, whether you want pulse width or modulation, its speed. Uh, here we have um, a quick LFO. We have the filter section here. The filter section sounds really nice on this uh, Poly 6 actually, with its own ADSR. Then we have a little effect um, section here that will do chorus, phaser, ensemble. Um, it has a VCA here to, you know, to, to determine how the ADSR is affecting the volume and it has a couple of functions here for the arpeggiator. Now what's really interesting because you see all these little sticker and colors here and you see the name Kiwi here. Uh, now Kiwi is um, a company that actually really legit does circuit bending. So they do an amazing job with synthesizers to give more functionality, an extra VCO potentially, more filter settings. This is the company you want to go to if you want to have your synth properly altered and not like in some of my other tutorials, uh, some guy in the garage that basically redid my drum computer and in the demonstration it actually died. Um, so if you have a very valuable piece of gear and you want to have it circuit bent, just look for companies that do it really well and Kiwi is one of them that you really want to talk to. Now I want to move to this wall here uh, where we have two more modules that I quickly want to point out to you. Um, this is the Triton Rack. Uh, Triton is basically Cork's answer to what Roland was doing and um, Roland was basically releasing all these insane um, modules, 19 inch, of which I showed you a couple, the JV1080, the XV3080, um, with all these samples of orchestral uh, world music, organs, bass guitars, drum kits, you name it, everything was in there. Um, to make, um, you know, to basically a please to a market where people wanted more and more sounds in their synthesizers so they can switch with one button to another and then have access to a full string ensemble, then to an organ and then to a rock guitar and all that kind of stuff. It was very popular in the 90s nowadays, nobody's really looking for that anymore, but um, it was popular in the 90s. But the interesting thing is that it has a really good effect processor. Um, it has is really complicated to uh, to program, and besides um, the fact that it's a synthesizer, it also allows you to make um, uh, samples, and um, that is uh, always very interesting. Like I told uh, in other episodes, like sampling has really been my thing, and there's a separate tutorial about sampling, and so go see that one. But so this was a very versatile synthesizer. It sounds very clean. Um, very hi-fi, uh, but the variety of sounds is absolutely insane. Um, the other one I wanted to point out to you is the Cork EX8000, which is the rack version of the DW8000. Now that was a really interesting uh, analog synth, um, completely com uh, controllable from the front, but because it's so hard to program, um, there's this company, I think they're in Argentina, and they make these really cute little boxes um, and this one is for the DV, uh, DW8000, so this one I can hook up directly to this box and I can actually, you know, like we saw in some of the other analog synths, just very quickly um, program 
uh, the, the sounds that I, uh, that I, that I need. Um, this is fully programmable, so you can go through different presets um, and uh, you can listen to them. At this point, this machine is not hooked up. Um, this, the, the configuration of how I use synthesizers is always slightly different, so some of them are hooked up, some of them are not. Um, it's a very interesting box, and especially these two boxes, um, you can easily pick them up on eBay for a couple of hundred bucks. They're not all that expensive, um, but they're hard to find, so, but they're not uh, expensive, and there are a lot of interesting boxes like that uh, out there in the world. And that concludes um, the stuff that I use from uh, Cork, and um, I hope to see you in another episode.